You know, it's like a, a secret society, almost, only the secret is open, just people choose not to see it. But it's a society that comes together, and we're living in dangerous times. We look in each other's eyes. We want to affirm one another, strengthen one another, and our purpose is to save the universe. Our purpose is to save every soul we can from eternal damnation. Uh, that's a secret society that's worth pledging our sacred uh, lives and fortunes to, our sacred honor, everything we have. That's, that's a society where, where you stand together and you have one another's backs and you say, I'm not going to live just for waking up another day so I can suck more oxygen, stuff more food down my gut, hit the toilet, <laughs> go to work, and come home so I can push the repeat cycle and do that again and again till I'm dead. But we're here for a very great and important mission. Is what we're dedicating everything we have to, and that's to honor God and bring as many people as we can into, uh, into a saving relationship with Him. I was thinking about what a church is. A church is a family. A church is a hospital where you can find healing for a sin-sick, world-weary soul. A church is a refuge because sometimes all you can do is go and sit down at the back of the church and say, oh, God, help me. And you can come. It's a holy place. And you know that the Lord is there. A church is a school. We go. Many of us take notes. We learn. Hopefully we learn more by, year by year. A, a soul is like a gymnasium for the soul, like the athletic club only to strengthen our soul. A church is a farm where we're growing people in the Lord. Churches, like I said, like a secret society or invasion force, an army uh, chosen, dedicated by God for the purpose of invading Satan's territory. Remember what Jesus said about himself? He said, Satan's a strong man. I'm a stronger man. I'm going to plunder his house. Well, Jesus has sent us on that mission as well. Plunder hell. Go and grab all the souls you can. Bring people to heaven. We'll have a bigger party. Plunder hell. If, if Satan doesn't hate our church, we're doing something wrong. Uh, I, have no, I have nothing to shake my fist at Satan other than standing on the cross of Jesus, by saying by the, at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. I stand with my Lord, but I'll tell you what, I hope he hates me, and I hope he hates this church. Don't you? I think we saw all these things working together this Christmas season. Church is a hospital. Church is a family. Church is a refuge, a school, a gymnasium, a farm, an army, and all of them working together. And, and it's not like you're only in one place. Sometimes you're in that refuge place. Oh, God, help me. I, I don't know what to do. And at the same time, you're grabbing people and bringing them to church with you. I mean, it can be several things all at once. And we saw this during the Christmas Day service. Remember what we did this year? We usually you come forward and get your candle, right? But uh, what we did this time is we had uh, Adam and we had Aaron, I believe. And uh, I started off with one candle, lit their candles. Then they went down the center aisle and lit the end candle. And then that person lit the candle next to them. And that person lit the candle next to them. One candle isn't very bright. But there was a beautiful glow when all the candles were lit. When a whole church is living for Jesus, it's a beautiful glow. And it's something that a dark world needs to see. So light your candle. And like we said before, don't hide it underneath a basket, but light your candle. And when, when everybody in the church is doing that, that's the way it's supposed to be. The great commission that Christ gave his church before he went back to heaven was given to us in, in Matthew 28. And this is God's plan for your life. if you trust him. 
If you, if you believe in Jesus, if you've given your heart, your life to God, this is his plan for you. Please listen. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what does that mean? He says, listen, I can say whatever I want to say, and here's what I'm going to say. I've got authority to say anything, and this is what I'm going to say. He says, all authority is mine, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Remember the word there is ethnos, ethnicity, all ethnic groups, all people groups. Go and make disciples of everyone. Well, I don't really want to talk about my faith. It's a private thing. Yes, and you're disobedient, being disobedient to your Savior. You don't get the cross, do you? You thought it was just for you, didn't you? No, it isn't. And then Jesus says, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So make people disciples, baptize them, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Oh, but I hate organized religion. I just want to do it all on my own. And surely I will be with you always, Jesus says, to the very end of the age. I'm going to be with you all the way. Jesus had all authority, and this is what he chose to say. The command is to go. It's active. We're supposed to seek out. Uh, we're supposed to make disciples, not just get people to say a heaven, a magic heaven insurance prayer. Okay, God, if you're there, please forgive my sins. I want to go to heaven, and I don't care about you. I don't care about the Bible. I don't care about you. what you want for my life. No, Jesus said, make them disciples. Make them disciples. Make them followers. People are committed to this. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, make it public. I'm identifying with God. I'm identifying with Christ and his death and resurrection. I'm identifying with all believers all the millions and hundreds of millions of them all over the globe who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus says, teach them everything. Well, there's two things we get out of this. One, if you're going to teach them everything, you better be studying yourself. Every single Christian is responsible to teach them everything. And second, don't give a partial gospel. Teach the whole thing. That's why we go slow and go through the Bible so we can learn the whole thing and not just hit on somebody's favorite parts. Jesus says he's with you, and here's what he thinks that means. So you can do it. I've given you a big job. I've got authority to say anything. Here's what I'm going to say. It's a big job. But don't worry because I'm going to be with you. I will be with you always. I will be with you to the very end of the age, or the end of this time. We're going to read in Luke now, and Jesus is going to say something very similar. This is dear to the heart of God. Don't settle for fake, showy religion. God's not a big fan of religious hypocrites. Be real. Uh, be real about your own need for a Savior. In other words, I need a Savior because I'm a sinner. You know what self-righteous means? And God doesn't want self-righteous Christians, right? Self-righteous means... I'm fine all by myself. I don't need God. I'm fine by myself. That is self-righteous. We need to say, Lord God, I'm a sinner and I need you. I'm messed up. I treat people badly. I've said and done and thought horrible, nasty things. Lord God, I can be so difficult for, for people to be around. Lord God, Father, forgive. And then we're not leaning on our own righteousness, are we? We're trusting God's rightness. Big difference. So, be real. Don't be fake. Don't be a religious hypocrite. Confess Christ publicly. Obey. And you can do this because God is with you and you're precious to him. The sermon title is, Jesus said, don't be a bozo. Luke chapter 12. Please open your Bibles, Luke chapter 12. Bob, I'm feeling better right now, but this morning I felt like I might, you know, toss my cookies or something. I don't want to get this beautiful carpet dirty, so be ready. Just be ready. 
<laughs> Thank you. Dive on the floor. Sacrifice yourself. Luke chapter 12, 1 to 7. <clears throat> meanwhile, so meanwhile is Jesus just had this conversation with the Pharisees and uh, they decided that they wanted to catch him. They wanted to trick him. So Bible says, so right after we heard that the Pharisees are waiting to try and catch Jesus and trick him, it says, meanwhile, in contrast to the Pharisees, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, in other words, they're falling all over themselves, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, what does Jesus say? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Well, what Jesus is saying here basically, is that there's a special temptation that goes along with being religious that's very tempting to, to be hypocritical. Instead of trusting in God's goodness and, and being honest about my own brokenness and the fact that I'm messed up and I need the cross, I need a Savior, instead of selling Jesus Christ, we start to sell people, look at me, how good and how wonderful I am. And we try to pretend to be something we're not. And what a horrible thing to do to come to church where we have the real God who wants to deal with our real problems and we put a mask on and pretend to be something we're not. I mean, it's like we're fighting with the Holy Spirit. You call yourself religious and meanwhile we're trying to keep God away. God is at war with human hypocrisy. God wants us to come clean. When you come clean, you can say, I'm not pretending anymore. I'm messed up. I'm not pretending anymore. I need a Savior. I need that cross. I need forgiveness. How are you ever going to say, Lord, forgive me, if you're always saying, no, I'm fine by myself? You won't. So here's what Jesus has to say. He says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. Because uh, yeast, you put just a little bit in the bread, and then it rises, it grows. Just a little bit of this pharisaical attitude in your heart can really grow, and you'll be judgmental and critical and, and hypocritical. There is nothing concealed, Jesus says, that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. In other words, why are you pretending you know you ain't full in God, right? You know you ain't full in God. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear of the innermost rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, isn't that nice? Jesus, God in flesh, saying, listen, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can do no more. Well, who is he talking about? He's talking about the Pharisees. These so precious religious people are the people that want to kill you, <laughs> make your life miserable. Uh, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. In, in our situation, there's, there's uh, I heard that, persecution of Christianity in China, some parts of China is increasing right now. Uh, Christianity has been, places, cities and towns where Christians have been there since the time of Christ in the Middle East, for this Christmas, for the first time in over 2,000 years, there were no Christians there in the Middle East because of ISIS, because of, because of the terrorism there. How horrible. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those folks who can kill you. Well, what does that mean? I tell you, my friends, this is God in flesh, and he wants to communicate something. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, and after that, they can't do anything to you. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, fear the one who has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. He's talking about God. Live a life in reverent honor and fear, trembling before holy God. I'm not going to bow before anybody. Oh, yeah. But then you're on the outside, aren't you? Fear the one who has authority to throw you into hell. Everything good and wonderful comes from God. All the beauty of nature comes from God. He's the one who made music and laughter and joy. And when we turn ourselves away from him, 
what's left over is only darkness. God is a gentleman. He won't force himself on anyone. There's only two kinds of people, as C.S. Lewis said, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those people of whom God says to them, thy will be done. So either I say, God, thy will be done in my life here and now, or one day I'll stand before the judgment seat, and all day, all my life I said, God, I don't want you, I don't want any part of you, and God will say, thy will be done, and we'll be separated for eternity. Verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. A famous teacher, try, a good teacher always tries to explain difficult passages in a way that people can understand. Well, I don't know if this is helpful. A fellow named Cyril, Cyril of Alexandria, who was called a, he, he was a great theologian, but he had a spotty record as far as the way he treated people went. But he was commenting on this passage, and he was writing about hypocrisy. And here's the way he explained it to, to some of these old-time Christians, you know, back in like the year 300 or so, 400. Hypocrisy is like an unattractive woman when she is stripped of that external embellishment which she produced by artificial means. I don't know if that's helpful or not. I wonder a lot of the old-timers went, oh, yeah, okay, now I get it. Yeah, Uh, The word of the church fathers. (laughs) Isaiah 29 tells us, these people, this is God speaking, he said, these people come near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. There's no love for God there. There's no love for God's people. You know, what what is the church? The church is called the bride of Christ. You don't talk badly about another man's bride. That won't go over well. But these people don't have any love. It's all surface. Jesus described it. He says it's like a mug. It's like a cup. It's clean on the outside, but it's nasty on the inside. You going to drink out of that? We don't want our religion to be all show, and there's no love in our hearts. That's a waste of religion, and how dare we call it Christianity? That's an embarrassment to Jesus Christ. So God wants us to obey because he has our hearts. We follow because we love. Remember what we keep saying? We're studying the the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, verse by verse, because we want to love Jesus more. We want to see who this is, God in flesh. When God came down from heaven, what was he like? And the more we learn about him, the more we're going to love him, the more hope we see in him. God doesn't care about empty religiosity. That's all about keeping the rules, but there's no real love or respect for God. That's why churches aren't just trying to get people to behave. (laughs) You know, maybe your school teacher wants you to behave. Maybe that's mom's job, you know. Churches are not just trying to get people to behave. We want people to fall in love with God and stay in love with God. And then we want people to obey God's rules because we love and trust Him and we believe He knows what's best. It's like a kid who loves his folks and that's why he wants to be good. Not because he, he's always uh, afraid of, of uh, punishment. There's a big difference. And that difference means a lot to God because he knows if you're just giving him surfacey stuff on the top or if you really care about him. He loves us. He wants us to love him. But if we love God, we will want to obey his laws. Listen, you can obey the law and not love God, right? You can have the law without God, but you can't have the God without the law. You can, you can have just legalism and not any love for God. But if you love God, you will want to be a good person. 
You will want to be a righteous person. You will want to obey what he's given us. Jesus said in John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, then keep my commandments. It's like some kid who says, I love you, mama, as he's tearing down all the shells and throwing stuff on the ground. And mom's like, you don't love me. If you love me, why are you doing this? So Jesus teaches these followers that they need to fear God. And I don't know all that that means. I think it's a lifelong journey of knowing what it means to fear God. But I would not be surprised at all if Christ were to come here today, talk to the modern church, talk to American Christians, if he told us just as forcefully as he said there, or possibly even more so, you guys really need to take this more seriously. You need to fear God. I think we're too casual with, oh, fearing God, fearing God. Verses 4 and 5, let me relook at those. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that they can't do any more. But more than fearing ISIS or some terrorist or somebody who's going to shoot you, I will show you whom you should fear. <laughs> Jesus says, I'm going to tell you who you should be afraid of. Fear him who, after your body is dead, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Do you notice how Jesus put more emphasis on that than we tend to? We just skip right over it. Explain it away. Oh, that really doesn't mean. In ancient uh, Jewish work, probably, this is kind of neat. It's not in the Bible. It's, uh, some Christians regard this as part of their Apocrypha. Some Christians don't. The Catholic Church doesn't have this book. It's 4th Maccabees, not 1st and 2nd Maccabees. There's actually 3rd and 4th Maccabees. Uh, and it's an ancient work. It's not biblical, uh, but it's an ancient Jewish book. In 4th Maccabees 13, 13 through 17, says, Let us with all our hearts consecrate ourselves to God. Now this is neat because it was probably written about the same time as Christ. Uh, could have been 1st century B.C., could have been 1st century A.D., like the New Testament, it doesn't reference the destruction of Jerusalem, so it's almost oh, it's written before 70 AD, right? Otherwise, it would have talked spoke about the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in, in the temple. Fourth uh, Maccabees uh, chapter 13. Let us all, with all our hearts, consecrate ourselves to God, who gave us our lives, and let us use our bodies as a bulwark for the law. Let us not fear Him who thinks He is killing us because the Greeks at that time were at war, and, and uh, these fellows who are speaking, a bunch of brothers, they were about to be killed by the Greeks. For great is the struggle of the soul and, and the danger of eternal torment lying before those who transgress the commandment of God. Therefore, let us put on the full armor of self-control, which is divine reason. For if we die, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will welcome us, and all our fathers will praise us. You know, reading that, it made me wonder if Paul was aware of this passage before he wrote Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, in contrast to armor of reason, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And Paul makes this point that the armor of self-control won't cut it. We need the armor of God because it's not just against human beings we struggle against, it, but it's the devil himself. So Paul puts this same idea that was in 4th Maccabees, and he puts it in the spiritual realm, saying it's not just the Greeks we're fighting, you know, it's the devil himself. Either Jesus and Paul were referencing 4th Maccabees, because Jesus has a similar concept here, right? He says, don't fear the person who can kill you, rather fear the person who can send your soul to hell. Same thing that 4th Maccabees is talking about. So either Jesus and Paul were refer referencing 4th Maccabees, or possibly the writer of 4th Maccabees was referencing them, uh, if, if it was written after uh, this New Testament was written, or Jesus and Paul didn't know about this work, and the writer of Maccabees, 4th Maccabees, didn't know what they had said, but all of them touched on the same subject because this was part of the atmosphere of 1st century, century Palestine. Now, two quick apologetic points here. One, this is yet again, yet again, another proof, not that we needed it, that the New Testament was not a Greek invention that's later shoehorned into a Jewish context. Uh, we see in an independent source, a Jewish source, 
that the exact same ideas were going on in Palestine at that time that we see in the New Testament. And, and secondly, a Jewish person once told me, and this is a common idea among many Jewish people, they say Jews don't believe in hell, uh, which is not universally true, and I knew that. Uh, but here we see in 4th Maccabees, and you can see it in many Jewish writings, older Jewish writings, uh, 1315, 4th Maccabees, for great is the struggle of the soul and the danger of eternal torment lying before those who transgress the command of God. Uh, it's very clear the idea of hell was very ancient there from the beginning. But I think there's no accident that right after Jesus tells this crowd of people, men, women, children, who are falling over themselves to hear, to, uh, falling over themselves, he tells them, you have to fear God. The very next thing he does is tell, does is tell them how much God cares for them, and he knows them intimately, even knowing how many hairs are on their heads before and after they shampoo. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading in a little bit into the text. Uh, Jesus says, this is how intimately God knows you. God knows how many ants there are. God knows how many grains of sand there are uh, in the world. There's, actually, there's more stars than grains of sand. Did you know that? More stars in the universe. And the Bible says God has a name for each star. Even the ones that flashed out long ago, we're just seeing their light now, but they've been gone for a long time. God knows it all. He's a big God. So you want to ask me again how he can hear everybody's prayer at the same time? Oh, he's big. Imagine how those folks felt to hear that when Jesus said, God knows when a sparrow hits the ground. God knows. God cares about the sparrows. He knows how many hairs are on your head. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. You're worth way more than sparrows to God. If God knows about sparrows, trust me, he knows about you. It's no accident that right after Jesus teaches this strong message, he says, now listen, God cares about you. I wonder, I wonder how they felt. You know, they didn't know at that time that Jesus was God incarnate, did they? They just knew that they had never heard a teacher like this before. They were amazed. They were talking to each other. Have you ever heard a teacher like this before? They didn't know, but we know who Jesus was. He was God, came down in flesh. And so you have God himself sitting down here. He says, I want you to know this. God cares. God cares. <clears throat> he sees everything. I'm going to read this passage again. In No matter where you're coming from this morning, whether you were a Christian from your little kid, whether just this last year you, you start following Christ and you got baptized, wherever you're at, whether... You've got fears, you're, you've got health concerns, you've got financial, financial concerns, you've you got trouble at school, uh, relationship trouble. No matter what you're going through, today, I want you to keep in mind as I read this, this is God himself who's telling you this. Listen, this is God himself who's telling you this. This is what God wants, to, wants you to know. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Now, take this context that you're precious to God, you're valuable to Him. You know, there's two ways you can understand this, what we just read. You could read it. Well, I'm valuable to God more than a few sparrows that are sold for a few cents anyway, which doesn't sound very valuable. Or you can remember who spoke these words and what he did for you and think, in God's eyes, in God's eyes, I'm worth bleeding for. God would suffer humiliation, as Chuck prayed for us this morning. God would suffer, God would come down, be born as a human being, he would suffer humiliation pain, anguish of his soul, so that I can be with him. God must really think I'm valuable. How much does God love you this much, right? Stretched out his hands and was nailed to a cross. God thought you are worth the death of God. That's incredible dignity, and that's an incredible honor. And don't ever think, God thinks I'm garbage. He's sick of me. He's going to throw me away. Don't ever think that. 
If Jesus would die for you, do you think he's going to throw you away because you failed to be the Christian you want to be? If there's grace for your sins before you were in his family, don't you think that there's plenty of grace for all the messed up, nasty, stupid things we've done since we've become believers? God values you. So with the context that we just read of God's concern for you, let's look where Jesus takes the conversation next. So God just says, I affirm you, I value you. Now look from verse 8. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge this person before the angels of God. In other words, when Jesus returned to heaven, the Son of Man is Jesus, and he's ruling on his heavenly throne, before the angels, he's going to say, this one's mine. This one belongs to me. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogues, the rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. What a neat passage. Since God loves you, don't worry and start sharing your faith. Isn't that interesting? Where he goes next with this, you're loved, you're valued, now don't worry, start sharing your faith. Don't worry, start telling others. Uh, Jesus wants us to have a contagious Christianity. God is the judge of the universe. We're, we, our butts are not big enough for the judgment seat. We're not supposed to be hypercritical, judgmental people. We're ambassadors of heaven. We share the grace. We share the love. We teach about the truth of God so that people know they need a Savior, right? People need to know they're a sinner before they'll say, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. But, but we should have a contagious faith. Brothers and sisters, I want you to think about the way you live your life. How do people see you? You've heard that old line, if Christianity were illegal in America, would there be enough evidence to convict you? How do you treat other people? Do people around you think, wow, this person reminds me of Jesus? How do you talk about your own life? And then I want you to ask a question. Would people around you want to catch your faith? If Christianity is contagious, would they want to catch it? Now, I want to talk about one of those difficult passages that periodically we're going to run across. Verse 10. Look at verse 10. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. This verse has brought a lot of fear and concern to many people's lives. And I've talked to numerous people who are afraid, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. I think I've committed the sin that can't be forgiven. Uh, I remember I, a few years ago, there was a YouTube campaign where, where people would get on, on, on YouTube and say, hello, my name is Dan Wolf, and I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And they'd go from person, and I would always think, you fool, fool, you don't even know how to properly blaspheme God. You think that you smiling, telling a camera, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you think he can't forgive that? Oh, he's a lot bigger <laughs> than you know. Uh, that is not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Uh, but people worry about this. Have I committed this sin? What is the, I don't want to blaspheme God. Before we, we jump at that question that everyone wants to jump at, what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is, I want to point out something very wonderful here. Very wonderful that I missed before because I'm like everybody else. Okay, what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, right? So I'm, I'm like everybody else. I missed this. In this great theologian, Matthew Henry, he lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s, so he's older than the United States, he pointed out, he said, this passage is so beautiful because Jesus is telling us clearly, clear as day, every other sin can be forgiven. So we fixate on what's the sin that can't be forgiven. Jesus is saying everything. Oh, yeah. Secret stuff, stuff you don't want anybody to know, stuff you're ashamed of even to admit to yourself, hard-heartedness, hard Struggle with belief, uh, all these things. 
a life controlled by fear or depression. or All these things where God is not the center of our life, but we're allowing these other things, the things we're most ashamed of, it can be forgiven. Jesus came to deal with sin, and he dealt with it properly. Isaiah 1.18 says, <clears throat> this old prophet, 700 years before Christ, God says, come now, let's settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Jesus wants to forgive. God wants to forgive completely. God's not a hard case. He's eager and willing to forgive. He says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God desires to bless. There is no gate on heaven's doors. The gate is in our own heart. When we say, no, God, stay away. So what is blasphemy, though, of the Holy Spirit? Because this is serious. Well, look at the context. And I can tell you several things that it ain't. It has nothing to do with suicide. Look it. It has nothing to do with suicide. Look at the context that we just read. Now, suicide is a horrible sin. It's a selfish sin. We shouldn't do it. We need to live our lives for Jesus Christ. But you know what? That's not the unpardonable sin. If you know somebody who's committed suicide, this isn't telling, telling you that there's no way they can be in heaven. That's not in the context. It'd be an incredible stretch. It'd be, you have to be really imaginative to try to work in suicide into this passage that Jesus is talking about. I've also heard preachers say that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Oh, yeah, I can see where that's... No, I can't. No, I'm, I'm trying to be honest with the text. Or more commonly, and I've heard this several times, I've heard that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. Come on, people. Look at the context. Christians, we can do better than that. Look at the context and tell me how it could possibly be that Christ was telling this crowd of first century Jews, following him around, in the middle of this sermon, warning against hypocrisy, urging people to be true believers, telling them forcefully, God cares about you, urging them to share, share their faith, and Jesus drops in and, and, oh, by the way, God can forgive anything, but don't kill yourself. God can't forgive that. Or, oh, hey, I know you guys have no clue what I'm about to say, but if you guys don't speak in tongues, you are like so going to hell. It's not in the text right? It's not. Honestly, in context, what it really looks like it has to do with re is rejecting Christ, rejecting God's offer of salvation. When the rubber hits the road, your answer will reveal your true heart. Will you admit your faith before others or deny him? And I don't think our salvation, by the way, is hanging on one crucial moment. <laughs> I think it's about our life. Are you denying Christ or you have you embraced Christ? The Net Bible puts it this way, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit probably refers to a total rejection of the testimony that this Holy Spirit gives to Jesus in the plan of God. It is not so much a sin of the moment as of one's entire life, an obstinate rejection of God's message and testimony. The Bible background commentary says, in this context, context is important, blasphemy against the Spirit may refer to a denial of Jesus, which, of which the denier, unlike Peter, never repents. See, every sin against Christ can be forgiven. But if you never take the grace, how can you be forgiven? So that's why, that's why foolish people who have posted videos online telling the world their names and I have rejected, I have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. You know what? If that's you, I have good news for you. God forgives, stupid. Uh, and, and the Holy Spirit is giving you a chance to repent. As long as you are alive, you have a chance to turn around and say, wait, God, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And you know what? You know how many people that God has turned away who said, God, please forgive me? About half. No. None. 
Nobody has ever come to the Lord and say, Father, forgive. Lord, please. I want to be part of your family. I want to be one of your followers. And Jesus said, no, no, not you. Nobody, everybody will be acceptable by God because of the work of Jesus Christ on that cross. The Bible Knowledge Commentary, which is put together by the folks at Dallas Theo. I didn't know that, or maybe I did, but I forgot. Uh, maybe says it best. The point of verses 8 through 10 is that discipleship, is that disciples must make a choice. Listen, must make a choice. To acknowledge Jesus before others denotes the fact that the disciples recognized him as the Messiah. Messiah means Savior. And therefore, they had access to the way of salvation. Let me read that again. To acknowledge Christ denotes the fact that the disciples recognized him as the Messiah, the Savior. And therefore, because they recognized Jesus as the Savior, they have access to the way of salvation. Those who did not acknowledge him were denying themselves denying themselves the way of salvation. Jesus carried the logic one step farther, noting that the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. In Matthew 12, 32, Jesus linked the activity of the Pharisees who were rejecting the work of Jesus. Apparently, the Pharisees were being convicted by the Holy Spirit that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, but they were rejecting his witness. They could never be forgiven because they were rejecting God's only means of salvation. In contrast to that, a number of Jesus' own brothers initially rejected him. Later, they came to faith and were forgiven, even though they had spoken against the Son of Man. And also, by the way, the Bible tells us that many scribes and Pharisees later put their faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't it great that the, the Pharisees, these symbols of legalism and hypocrisy, later came to faith in Jesus Christ? Many of them did. Well, if there's hope for a Pharisee, there's hope for me. See, God is offering salvation through Jesus Christ, and any sin can be forgiven. But if you reject what the Holy Spirit wants for you, there is no other way. If the Holy Spirit is offering you this path of salvation, you say, no, there is no other way. The parallel verse in Matthew 12, 32 tells us, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. And Dr. J.B. Lightfoot, who died in 1889, points out that this passage would shut the door on the idea that sins can be forgiven after death. All sins can be forgiven, but the sin of rejecting this offer of grace, the sin of blasphemy against what the Holy Spirit wants to do, can never be forgiven ever. Hebrews 2.3 puts it this way, So what makes us think we can escape? So what makes us think we can escape? if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak in person. J. Vernon McGee writes, When a man blasphemes with his mouth, that is not the thing that condemns him, it is the attitude of his heart. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to resist his convicting work in your life and in your heart. You know you're a sinner? We said you can't understand Christmas unless you know you're a sinner, unless you understand your sin. Jesus came because our sin separates us from God. God wants to bring us back into relationship with him. All three, <coughs> uh, in this context, it was the Pharisees who were rejecting the work of Jesus Christ. Today, it would encompass people who reject the reality of God, right? They reject God's reality because... Is, is rejecting the reality of God the unforgivable sin? No, but think of it. Let your thoughts follow. If you reject the reality of God, you're never going to go to him for forgiveness. And that's why there is no uh, forgiveness for that sin. People who, like the Pharisees, are religious. Second group of people, they're religious. But don't come to God for correction. correction. Cultural Christians. Very religious. Go through all the ceremonies. Go through all the rituals. But they don't let God correct them. They never let the Holy Spirit challenge their heart. <clears throat> they dictate to God what their faith will look like, not the other way around. In America, a third group of people would be uh, many people guilty of the unpardonable sin. We call them apatheists, right? They're guilty of the unpardonable sin because they believe maybe in some vague way there's a God, but that belief doesn't mean much to them, doesn't affect their life, and they don't care. 
All three groups are examples of people who won't humble themselves before God, won't accept Jesus Christ's sacrifice for their sins. Jesus Christ paid for their sin, and they won't even say thank you. They keep Jesus at arm's length. And if we reject the Savior, how can we be saved? Doesn't that make sense? If we reject the Savior, how can we be saved? That's the unpardonable sin. The person who has not committed this sin, I'm, this is my closing remark, because folks have come to me in counseling and said, I'm afraid I've committed the unpardonable sin. The person who has not committed the unpardonable sin is the person who says, I really want to be a Christian, but I'm afraid I committed the unpardonable sin. I, I really want to be with Jesus. I really want to go to heaven, but I'm afraid I've committed the unpardonable sin. They're terrified that something they did has ex eternally excluded them from fellowship. Remember the words of Peter, who said to the crowd in Jerusalem, Acts 2, he quoted the prophet Joel and said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And who was Peter? He was the man who rejected Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ was in the custody of the people who would kill him. He denied Jesus Christ, and then the rooster crowed, and he ran out, and he wept bitterly, what have I done? But he repented of his rejection. And there's forgiveness for everyone who will come to Jesus. There's forgiveness to everyone who will come to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, here we are. Father, together, corporately, we want to unite our hearts and say, Lord God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for our sins. Jesus, we want to follow you everywhere. We want to love you. We want to be more like you. Lord, teach us to obey, not just out of empty ritual or routine, but because we're learning to love you and appreciate you and fear you and and we know that your ways are better than our ways, Lord God. And Father, we don't want to be afraid of the world. We don't want to be afraid of what people think of us, what, what people say about us, Lord. But we, we want to care about what you think. So, Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to not deny your name in front of others, but to boldly proclaim Jesus Christ, your Son, wherever we go. And Father, I pray that everyone knows that we love you. And Father, if there's folks. that deep down inside they know that they need you. Father, I pray that we don't fail them. But we will be able to share our faith in you with them. And Lord, we thank you that you promised to give us the words to say. God, thank you for this Bible. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time we had together. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.